Hi everyone, and welcome back to Know Your Data, the data literacy project series that helps you unpack the charts, tables, and the language that you're seeing every day online and in social media in relation to coronavirus data so that you can figure out what it means for you right now. I'm Kevin Hannigan, the Chief Learning Officer of Click, and I'm joined by Alan Schwartz, a former Pulitzer-nominated reporter for the New York Times. Over the next six minutes, we're gonna take a look at testing and what people are now calling enough testing. Alan, why don't you jump in here? Well, thanks, Kevin. Of course, a test is how we determine whether one individual does or does not have the coronavirus, and that's, that's simple, right? Well, then why do we get things like this? All right, now this is one of the charts of overall data that has gotten compiled from individual testing, and it gets complicated fast with all sorts of words to describe it flying around. Now, since we can't test the entire population, some groups, samples, are getting tested more than others. We're gonna talk about that. How do these different samples affect the data we see? What patterns are we looking for? And more than ever right now, we keep hearing about when there will be enough tests. Here's just a sampling. Coronavirus, is the UK testing enough people? US still can't do enough testing, inadequate testing. And to be honest, this really isn't a new concept, the concept of enough testing. Here's uh, something from 2016. Does Philadelphia test enough homes for lead in water? So this is a concept we've dealt with before. And what does enough tests mean for us moving forward? One thing that's important, we are not making judgments about how any testing should be done. We are looking at the data we see on what is being done and what that means. So Kevin, let's just start with why is testing so important in the first place? Yeah, thanks, Alan. There's really three main reasons for testing people and collecting the data. First, so that we can diagnose individuals who do have symptoms so we can help them get the appropriate medical care. And then after that, we wanna identify any patterns on how the virus is spread. And third, we wanna identify potentially where the virus has spread or is going to spread and to what extent. We see charts in the media all the time showing things like the percentage of positive tests. But is that really telling us anything about the entire population? Can we use that one number to identify any patterns of how prevalent the virus actually is? Unfortunately, we can't, it's not that simple. This isn't like an election poll where we can take a random sample of say 5,000 people and have a very good idea about how an entire country will vote. In election polls, if the sample truly is random, meaning if it hasn't under or overrepresented any demographic or group, then we can be very confident with the various projections. But we can't do that with the coronavirus testing today. Different countries can't just test everyone every day, and they won't be able to for a long time. You can't do them randomly like a poll taker, and that makes it hard to detect widespread patterns, data points that start to become related and maybe tell a story about hotspots and then maybe potentially immunities. The samples we've seen with the coronavirus are actually anything but random. Testing is focused on people with the worst symptoms than healthcare workers, and particularly at-risk populations and groups like that. We might be learning a lot about those people, but it really can't tell us anything about the public at large. So in the coming weeks, when you see the simple statements like X percent of the population have tested positive for the coronavirus, you need to ask yourself, who have they actually tested? They tested an entire closed cruise ship, of say 700 people where COVID became rampant, or maybe they're testing a small town in Utah where no one is showing symptoms. These are all questions to keep in mind. As to the point of how many tests are enough to accomplish our goal, Alan, take us there for a moment. Well, unfortunately, enough is more of a squishy and subjective term than anything scientific. No magic number is enough, at least for now. The best way to put it is that the more tests you have, the more you, that you can strategically use them to pursue more questions and hopefully get some instructive and confident answers from the data you collect. One of the things we're hearing more and more about is doing more widespread testing of people who don't have symptoms to see if they have the virus anyway. Frankly, I might have the coronavirus right now and not know it. I'm just in the four to seven day incubation period and could be spreading it to others. We need to know if people who are asymptomatic 
do have the virus. We're going to see more of that. And of course, we're going to see more testing for antibodies, for immunities, in order to see if we can find those patterns to tell more stories. And of course, we will be here, Kevin and I, to explain it all to you. But before we wrap up, there is one thing I want to emphasize. When it comes to data that you see on diseases and tests, sometimes what sounds bad, like bad news, can actually be very good. I'll give you just one example. In the late 1980s, the news media did a ton of reports on how breast cancer cases had gone up 32%, suggesting that women were getting breast cancer far more often, but that wasn't true. There were the same number of cases. It was our testing that had gotten better. More and more women were getting early screening and therefore treatment, and that saved thousands of lives. Thanks, Alan. So three takeaways from this episode. If we think about samples, remember that selective sampling does not equal random sampling. And as that relates to patterns, when you have selective sampling, it limits our ability to identify these patterns. And finally, as it relates to enough tests, as Alan said, there's no magic number, but more tests is better to get more valuable insights from the data. One last reminder, everybody, if you want to know more or want us to cover something you've seen in the media or online, comment below and include hashtag BeDataBrilliant in your social post or email us at hello at the data literacy org. Stay safe, everyone, and we'll see you next time.